Nearly two years ago, we visited the unique garden and home of Wayne Myers, who has a penchant for collecting historic memorabilia, particularly relevant to the central New York area. In a way, his passion for the past has made him an unofficial local historian, and his thoughtful displays of 19th and 20th century antiquities within his hand-constructed buildings, from a watermill to a cider house, for example, show his deep love for a time of history that most of us have either forgotten or had never known. Walking through Wayne's gardens is a trip back in time to when working with one's hands was a way of life. Wayne makes those stories of our grandparents' and great-grandparents' generations more accessible through his lifelong passion, and we were excited to finally return to his place to do a more comprehensive tour of his turn-of-the-century agricultural equipment and the construction of two new buildings, including a dairy shed and a corn crib. We'll trust you'll enjoy this tour with Wayne. There's two new buildings, I guess, since you've been here. And was it because you just had too much stuff and needed more room? Yeah, I keep running out of room and have to build another <laughs> building. I build them too small. <laughs> <laughs> well, the last time we were here, it was towards the end of the year and the, it was dry. Yeah, it was dry, dry, dry. Yeah, but your gardens are looking exceptionally lush since that time. <laughs> <laughs> They're better than they were. Yeah. And last year was pretty bad, too. Yeah, well, it was really rainy, which oh. is like I felt, felt like the opposite. To the river, to the river we go. Leave our worries on the shore and drift away. On the river, on the river we know. Sometimes the perfect words are never said. I spill my coffee, I don't feel like talking my worries just keep growing by the day i need a moment where the green and blue appear to spin a rock and watch the ricochet to the river oh, if you you didn't go all the way through the mill before i think we took mm -hmm. some pictures of the wheel mm -hmm. which we can do again if you want but I changed the mill around because a lot of the corn shellers that were in here, which had gotten more than what you were here last time, got like 13 corn shellers. Oh and so I took, built the corn crib and put all the corn related stuff out there. So I have a lot more room in the mill here now. Well, wh which one do you want to show us today? Yeah, let's start here. Okay. We've got some far more organized too. We've got some bats that live in here during the day, but I can't find them. I don't know where the crack is. Well, I think I think it's but a benefit these. that you have bats, no? Oh yeah, yeah I don't mind just, them. Yeah. But that's a guano on the floor. <laughs> I'll sweep it up one day and it's back the next. <laughs> yeah. So you have all these different pitchforks and... Yeah, all garden, old garden tools, what three is, tines, four tines. What is this called? It's a cultivator. Oh, that's a cultivator, cultivator. okay. <clears throat> and that type will expand and contract. Yeah, I had to move this from 
that building in order to put the potato planters in there because they got too many plows where the potato planters were. <laughs> this is my donation book. And uh, I, I try to put everybody's name in here and what they donated. Yeah. Over the years, I'm sure I've missed somebody, but all these are people that have donated stuff over the years. Yeah. And then, so you have some other, these little sharp shears they look like. What are, the, yeah, what are those? Yeah, these are, they're both grass shears and sheep shears. Now the grass shears are longer in general and the sheep shears are shorter, but they're basically the same thing. These are the ads from a 1897 Sears and Roebuck catalog. Oh my goodness. And it, it says the sizes of them and they actually overlap a little. So. Yeah. <laughs> But there's a whole box of them there. <laughs> I tried to put a couple of different ones up for display. I had never seen a, a barrel cart with a wooden roller on like this. Wait, what is that? It's a barrel cart. OK, that, so you put the barrel uh, on there yep, and you yep. move it? And that's what most of these are, barrel and feed carts. But usually they have a metal or wooden wheels. Yeah. I just got that a short time ago. Yeah, this is a. Uh, Hetchel or a heckle, and that was laid usually like on a sawhorse type affair. And you took a bundle of flax and swung it down over there and pulled it through, and it straightened out the fibers and hmm. broke the fibers up to make make the strands for the thread. And do they typically like let the flax kind of uh, wane in the field before they? Or, yeah, 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 okay. And yeah, then, then they take it out dried, and do yeah. that. Yeah, these are feed holding sacks. They used to make them with nails in, but they ripped the bags up. So then they started developing other types because hmm. it's difficult to fill a bag without somebody there to hold it. Right. And these I can put under my, uh, these are discharge chutes from the bins upstairs. So I can park that underneath it and I've got extensions that go on these so I can fill them from here. And you actually, use it just no, for, or as demonstration no. or just no I I'll never uh, do any grain in here I'll yeah. have a bigger rodent problem than I already got yeah <laughs> <laughs> this is a very rare bag that was a flower sack that was airdropped in France and England after World War II donated by the people of the United States hmm. so this is a uh, Actually, 1890s uh, farm style stone grinder. A stone uh, grinder? Yes, to grind grain with. Okay. But there are two stones in here. There's like the big mill stones out there. Yeah. The big mills, the top stone was the runner stone, and the bottom stone, the stationary stone or bed stone. These are reversed. So the bottom stone is the runner stone, and the top stone is the bed stone. The Spencer Historical Society gave me this. It belonged to the Berlue family between Spencer and Kander, hence the initials LHB and ANB on it. Mm -hmm. They had apparently redressed the stones in 1931 and reported this back in concrete and they put 1800 on here, but this wasn't invented until 1890. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta take a chisel and put a little <laughs> leg on that. But but it didn't have the hopper stand or the hopper. And uh, I thought I'd find one someday maybe, and I never did, so 20 years later I, I had the picture of it. Yeah. So I built a hopper stand and the, the shoe and the damsel and a small hopper, and it looked all right. And you know, the year after, we went down to Bostick's to a tool auction, and this sat on the floor at the auction, I picked it up, and it's A.W. Stevens, the exact same one that's oh supposed to goodness. go on this machine. <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> it's so funny because it's like one of those things where you, you're you looking for something and it manifests itself, yep. you know. <laughs> it always happens. So. Yeah. <laughs> this wheel here operates a pulley underneath that's belt tightener pulley mm -hmm. for the main belt if I have that hooked up, which I can. I can actually run the equipment now. Hmm. What I like about all these like contraptions is that you 
there's ways to fix it. You know, like yep. you could see the parts, they're kind of yep. like on display, mm -hmm. the way that you're explaining them with like, you know, this is connected to yeah. this part or whatever. It's something yeah. that is easily fixable that you can these, do. These are the original bucket elevator shafts from the old Albright feed mill, and it has a piece of the old original bucket elevator belt in it. Yeah. That takes grain after it comes out of the fanning mill. It goes into a, a bin in the basement and then over to a bin underneath this, and this takes it up and dumps it in a diverting barrel upstairs. There's four bins upstairs and you can turn the diverting barrel by either this pulley here and you'll see I have the bins numbered. So you can direct this into any bin you want. So then uh, you can have at least four different kinds of grain yeah. to work with. Uh, in this case the number three bin upstairs will be the corn bin. and. Uh, You'll see why once we get up there. But this was my grandfather's feed bin, nothing special only to me, but I emptied and filled that many times as a, as a kid. <laughs> so. And then this is a feed mixing barrel, so you can yep. get multiples and just like, yeah, and, and does it just shovel, move? Open the top, shovel what you wanted in. This represents a molasses barrel, so you could add molasses to it for mm. cattle feed. And then you just uh, close it up and turn this. It's almost it, like one of those compost aerators. It's, you can, it's the same thing. Yeah. You can buy the exact same thing in ABS or PVC on the yep. catalogs. Keep that on there so kids won't start it up and knock <laughs> each other in the head with it. <laughs> <laughs> This feed cart here <clears throat> actually has a bagging, a bag holder on it. Oh yeah, right on. Clamp the bag on it. All cobwebs are original. <laughs> <laughs> Comes with the territory. I did have all my corn planters and most of my corn planters in here, hand corn planters, but I had so many of that they were taking up too much room, so they went in the corn crib as well. So I added a couple shelves here. Look, you even saved some of the Those tags. are some of the original old feed bag labels. I save all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Clean out barns and so on. These two here are tobacco transplanters. They transplants tobacco. Tobacco is a very fine seed. And so you usually start it in a flat. And when the plants got big enough, you set them out. And of course, digging a hole and putting them in the hole is backbreaking work. So the plants would go in this tube, the fertilizer and water would go in this tube. And you just jab that in the ground like a, a hand corn planter. And were the plants and like literally this um, length? No, like they, they would have been smaller. Smaller than that, okay. And you jab it in. Or not this length, but I mean this up. width. No, they probably would have been smaller. Okay. Uh, and you pull this handle and that opens this and lets the plant out. Right. And then you, there's another lever up there that you push and that lets water out into it. Huh. Unbelievable. Have you ever like found something that you're just like, what, what was this used for? And then what's your process mm -hmm. of trying to figure out well, what it's part of the case. fun of doing it is is finding stuff that I don't know what is. Yeah. And I've got a lot of books on antiques and I can generally find them in there, but if there's something that I can't, my best friend from kindergarten on, Bob Johnson down in, in Renaton, uh he's good on the computer. So he looks things up for me and finds a lot of stuff. Yeah. And he enjoys doing that as well. So I'll head upstairs here. Now with a wooden water wheel, once you got the wheel going, you kept it going 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Because mm -hmm. if you stop a wooden wheel at night, the water drains out of the top part of the wood into the bottom part, and it becomes out of balance. Oh, I see. My little 10-foot wheel is small enough so it gets out of balance, but doesn't hurt anything. Mm -hmm. It wasn't uncommon to have a 30 or 40-foot diameter wheel, and if you shut that off and then started it up the next morning, it would be so out of balance it would physically shake the mill apart. Oh. 
<laughs> so we had to disconnect the equipment, but you had to keep the wheel running yeah. all night. And to do that, originally they had wooden bearings, later on Babbitt bearings, which had to be oiled frequently. So the miller would stay in the miller's quarters in the mill or building close to the mill and get up every couple hours to oil bearings. So this is my miller's quarters, a little more elaborate than he would enjoy. <laughs> my uh, medicine cabinet is fully stocked. <laughs> and this basket here had a friend that I had in seventh and eighth grade basketball. Lives on uh, Fisher Settlement now, actually, Tom Sharp. And uh, he worked for a guy that had a bunch of apartments in Ithaca and yeah. around. And he found this upstairs in the uh, one of the buildings he was working on. Asked the guy if he could have it, and it was up in the attic. And it's, it's a nice splint basket. But it says Ithaca S-T-R-Y Company, and I couldn't figure out what the heck that was. Yeah. And Bob looked it up on the computer for me, and that's the Ithaca Street Railway Company. Huh. This is from the original streetcars from Ithaca. Wow. Now, they had a, uh, the only reason I can think that they would have a basket like this on a streetcar is they had an excursion train that went from downtown to Stewart Park, which was a popular picnic area. Yeah. And whether they sold this full of, or rented it out, or so Yeah, or maybe of, had a bunch of apples in yeah, it for people to have a, a picnic whole, with. <laughs> whole picnic lunch or whatever, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. That was kind of a neat That would be piece. so cool if Ithaca got its streetcars back, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, this, found oh, this up in Farmington all the way up past uh, Canandaigua. It's from the Ithaca Produce Company. <laughs> and then that's their telephone number? Yep. <laughs> so funny. But it was on 108 North Aurora Street. Uh, I've got some information on that, but what came in this cardboard box, yeah. I have no idea. There's, I mean, there's I wonder, no smell or anything in it that I can Do you think determine. some seeds or something? Or? But they But they our sold. specialties are oysters and clams. Yeah, but yeah. They, they sold all kinds of produce. Yeah. And coffee, but if it doesn't smell like, I would imagine yeah, it would still retain Yeah, coffee, I would the think you'd smell, still yeah. smell it, but that was kind of a neat find for a couple bucks. Yeah, <laughs> not bad at all. And I have to find it north of Canandaigua <laughs> from Ithaca. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a new perfection kerosene stove, kitchen range. It has a kerosene jug there that feeds kerosene, and then each burner has a round wick in it. And all the mica is original on the windows. Do you attempt to, when you get something like this and you bring it in, do you attempt to try to use it and to see if it still works? Like yeah, this I wouldn't dare because it's probably got some leaks on it. And yeah. these were exactly the safest thing in the world. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, they actually made a gasoline one prior to the making this. Yeah. I went to a yard sale in, in uh, Newfield a couple years ago, and I found this in a box of stuff. That's one of the original brand new wicks. Oh yeah, this. look at that. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. So that was kind of a neat find. And it's a big wick too. That's why I look through all the old boxes. Yeah. <laughs> you got a lot more um, kitchen accoutrements here yeah, since the yeah. last time. And I've actually weeded out a lot of the uh, cast ironware that yeah. was reproductions and yeah. so on. And so it's so all I've got is Griswold and Sydney ware. So the originals. Here. And now a nice this little, little copper kettle. This little box down here is an oven. Oh my God, is, it looks like a little like a conventional oven yeah. that they sell you now. You set on top of the burner and yeah. you a little oven. To, and this is a hot water urn. You'd set that on your stove, not necessarily this one, but yeah. any wood coal stove and you had hot water on tap. Mm -hmm. A couple old rat traps. That's a rat trap or is that a grinder? Yeah. No, that, oh, those, this, these, these are the are, rat yeah, traps. Okay. Yeah. 
These are a, a three-minute bed bread mixer. Okay, I was going to gonna say that would be a terrible rat trap. No. <laughs> <laughs> grind them. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's much nicer. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Fisher store that used to be in Spencer, I found uh, pieces of a crate. Let's say H. H. Fisher. Hmm. And that's the same ones, that, same family that owns the bank down there now. Oh wow! Okay, <laughs> and is that part of the the Fisher Settlement Road? Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's neat to have that kind there. of local history that and you just find. At the other end there, it does just not complete. Yeah. Place. You can't read it as well, but it is there. And this stove was made in Rochester. It's called a Flower City Oak because Rochester was known as the Flower City originally. Really? Because there are a lot of greenhouses and uh, plant places there. And... So they called it the Flower City. Now it's called the Lilac City because they have a lot of lilacs there. Does does this then did this um, kind of heat a greenhouse or was it in a no, like a regular was, house? No, it was just a, it called a flower oak because it was made in Rochester. Okay. Made by uh, J M Wilson Company actually, but I repainted that uh, last year, year before. Yeah. It was all rust. Well, you did a f fabulous job. It looks brand new. Yeah. <laughs> uh, these would have been nickel plated, but the nickel plating usually peels off mm -hmm. over the years. And I used uh, aluminum uh, automotive high temperature paint on it. Mm -hmm. Not that I have a fire in there, but I, I could have. Yeah. The building inspector had a fit because and he came up and saw this. He said, oh, you got to have a triple wall chimney going through. And I said, well, it's, I don't use it. It's just for looks. <laughs> and that's how they would have done it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the farmer or the... Uh, you said that's not historically accurate. <laughs> <laughs> where the uh, miller might fix his shoes during the night. That it, you know, it was off times. And so I got a whole mess of cobbler's tools. Where do you, like, so when you source, like, um, a board like this, when you're building, do you... We get them out of old barns that we yeah. tear down. And, okay. Yeah. And I love just, like, the knot, like, the knots and the holes in it and yeah. everything. It just... Yeah. just looks right. Yeah, <laughs> it does. And this latch actually came out of my house originally, off one of the house doors inside. It says D and D on it, or no? That's not. That's the. That's it. Always, that it always looks like a duck to it me. It does. It looks like a little, a little animal, <laughs> like a snake here, and then a little <laughs> face. <laughs> but this is my pulley collection for hay pulleys that went in the top of the barns to draw loose hay up into the mow. I've got, I don't know, 40, 50 of them. Uh, these are bean sorters. You would treadle this and this belt comes around, you put your beans in here and the beans come out separated separately here. Mm -hmm. I have another one over there with the boxes and uh, the boxes on this one are missing. But uh, the good beans, it's a really nice ones that you might want to save for seed for next year, you'd put in one box the bad beans that weren't good for anything, you'd put in the other box for cattle feed or whatever. Mm. And, the other ones would come off the end and go down through a chute, and you'd have a bucket down there to get the ones that you were going to use for feeding, eating. This is a corn cracker, which cracks the whole grain corn. Uh, this was actually the heaviest piece that I brought up here. I had a chain fall set up there before I put the railing in and brought the, the feed grinder in this up. Yeah. This uh, bin on the other side would be the corn bin, and the corn would come down into that chute, and going down this chute with this door in this position, it goes down into the stone grinder downstairs. Right. And then if you wanted to put it through the corn cracker, you just swing that that way, and it would go into the corn cracker. Yep. And so each, each machine has its own belt pulleys on it, I had a very, I got a lot of stuff packed in a little space here. Yeah, you do. <laughs> I had to have room for the chutes, and they had to be at the, an angle big enough so that the grain would go down them all right. 
I had to have room for the shafts and the pulleys and the equipment, of course, and the belt tighteners on each piece of equipment. So I had a little notebook that I sketched out what I wanted to do the next day and so it wouldn't interfere with something else. And by the time I was done, I had a notebook that thick that probably drawings that rivaled Da Vinci's. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you kept that notebook. You should display it somewhere here. <laughs> but uh, this is the mechanism, the belt that drives the bucket out of here. This is pretty neat. Yeah, like just it's how probably oily. So yeah, it is a little bit, but. Uh, I don't know if you know what a dingle stock is. No, but that's a funny name. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's well, probably in the dictionary any longer. Well, you know, like if you get you, you dent your car and you get a dingle in your car. Yeah. That's, I guess, where it came from. Okay. Uh, these are dingle stocks. You would take these out in the field when you're cutting with a scythe. Oh, and okay. And you drive this into a, a log or a stump along the side of the field. Uh-huh. And of course, you'd constantly be hitting rocks with your scythe and right. dingling them. Yeah. So you, this was an anvil, and this was the dingle hammer, hammer you carried with you, and you'd put it on here and flatten it out. If you were really good, supposedly you could sharpen a scythe without a whetstone with just a dingle hammer. Huh. But this is a cow horn with a metal bracket on it that you'd hook on your belt. And this carried your whetstone with you to sharpen the, the size. Wow. That's so cool. I mean, even just to like find something like this, yeah, to I, know exactly what it's for. And it has an inscription on it too. Yeah, I couldn't make out, it's got initials on it, but yeah. I couldn't. L-I-X-L or whatever, who, yeah. Who knows what that oh, was Oh my goodness. But these, uh, from here on over, are all hay-related and, you know, potato fork and... I mean, I just love how, rakes. like, rudimentary but sophisticated yeah. it is, you yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then this bin is, you know, from this give you a little more light. This is all ice harvesting equipment. I had a girl from uh, Ithaca that her family had a uh, camp up between halfway between Old Forge and, and Utica mm -hmm. in the Adirondacks. And she was here, she lives in Ithaca, and her next door neighbor had been here photographing several times, and he brought her out, and she found out that I took donations, and she asked me if I'd like a ice plow. Yeah. That goes for $800 on the internet. Wow. <laughs> but we went up and to get it, and she thought she could get it in her car, and she found out it was heavier than she thought. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so would they would they put that on some type of, like, or they would just... You, you would set that on the, the pond that you're cutting ice blocks yeah. from. And if this company had an option, uh, went on these two pins here that plopped either way, and I had another set of knives that would just score a parallel line, mm -hmm. and then you'd go the other way, and that would just mark out your blocks. But you, are you physically and moving it yourself, or no, is it on you, a horse? or you hooked a horse to it, Okay. and obviously you couldn't cut all the way through the ice. Yeah. Uh, you'd have to make several passes, depending on how ice, how thick the ice was. Right. And then when you get to down to the point where it gets dangerous because you don't want your horse to fall and you to fall in the lake. Yeah. Uh, you would take an ice saw and finish sawing out the blocks by hand. But they had one uh, that was adjustable. You could make, I think, from 16 inch to 28 inch blocks. The standard size, I think, was 26 inch. And huh. they had one of those, and the ads for it says that the, the 26 inch standard one is is more rugged than the adjustable one. Then is the the idea that they were cutting ice in order to like store food? Yeah, or, okay, yeah okay. preserve food. Yeah. We went into, uh, they stored it in ice houses packed in sawdust and they used it and the ice man would deliver ice to your house for your ice box, your yeah. refrigerator and whatnot. Now this is the patent information for this, which is a very early hay knife, or hay fork rather, that uh, went on a, a pulley to 
pull hay up off your wagon loose hay hmm. and carry it into the barn. And then his, that was done by A.B. Sprout. And then seven years later, his brother L.B. Sprout in Muncie, Pennsylvania, developed this, which is the, one of the first hay cars. And I have one of those here for demonstration. I've got it hooked up um, to carry feed. I can open that trap door there mm -hmm. and the gate and, and raise and lower things there. But originally this would have been a hay fork hanging on here. But this is the original track and it runs, just slides on the track wood right. on wood. Right. Well, it's got a stop here that will catch and you just, of course this would have been in the top of the barn so yeah. you had another rope hooked to it and your horses would pull it out through the side of the barn and you slide this over and uh, it hits that release over there and you want to make sure nobody's underneath and have a good hold of the rope because it goes down fast if you don't. <laughs> it's so challenging for me to see all these tools and I could maybe guess as to what they could be used for, but it would be well, such a fun quiz to be like, can you imagine what this is? Because I would have not imagined this as well, a hay we, fork, uh, you know? We were invited to take a bunch of tools over to Danby here must have been four or five years ago now, to a tool identification quiz that they sponsored. Yeah. And so we took several things over. And once in a while, people would know what they were. Most of the time, most people now have no idea. Oh, yeah. It was just Some like of the older huge, people yeah. remembered, but. Right. It's amazing how much gets lost in just a couple generations. Oh, yeah. 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 But these are my feed bins here. Uh, labeled one, two, three, four, you can actually turn the, the bucket, the barrel from up here, mm -hmm. which sits up at the top. And that was the same, did that correspond with the feed yep. downstairs yep. then? Yep. Yeah, it's the same pipe that the arrow is, that's the original pointer that's from the old mill in Newfield. And you could adjust this to the amount of whatever kind of grains you wanted mixed in your, your feed grinder. And in this position, the corn would go into the corn grinder or the corn meal grinder. But if you flip that down this way, you could put the corn into the feed mixture. And this operates by two belts that run in opposite directions, and there's two knobby plates that run in opposite mm -hmm. directions that grind the grain. And the belts are just made out of, like, thick woven fabric? It's, uh... They're leather and fabric. Mm -hmm. uh, originally, they used all leather, and then they went to the fabric, and then they had a rubber insert, and mm -hmm. then they went to all rubber. And mm. A lot of times, the old feed bags like these, they were expensive back then, so the farmer would put his name on them, and when he took them to the mill to get feed grind, ground, he would have Take the same. Back bag back and yeah. I've got several here, some from the Spencer area. There's a Williams, E.H. Seeley, which came from Spencer. Uh, the S is backwards here. <laughs> Same thing with your bricks. <laughs> yeah. uh, Same well, problem they, sometimes. They put them on with a stencil. And, yeah. And uh, Ferris was from Spencer. Uh, Sutton was from Spencer. And then I got some more over here. Those are kind of neat to find. Absolutely. So in this mill, you'd bring your horse and wagon up here with bags of grain and, and pull them up with that pulley, swing them in, and they'd be weighed on this scale and then dumped into this hopper. And from here, they go into the fanning mill, which cleans the grain downstairs, and then into the bucket elevator and up into the other equipment. These are all hay hooks to, for baled hay. Uh, there's some that are uh, bigger hooks, like these. Yeah. And these are hog hooks. These are where you hook in the hog's jaw, jowl, and when you put the hog in the scalding kettle, you could flip them around in the kettle to scald I see. 
and these flat ones like this are for pulp wood. Basically the same thing, but they made them flat. For mm -hmm. What reason, I don't know. And the little ones here are, are box hooks. These were used to handle freight hmm. at a train station or whatever because everything came in wooden boxes. Mm -hmm. I think that pretty much does the mill here inside. So this is a, a fanning mill, like the hand fanning mills in there. It cleans the grain. It's a very fancily painted one. It's, uh, yeah. It was one of only two companies that made a fanning mill with a bagging chute on it. You could tell that this was like part of their marketing was to make it. Yep, yep. that's why really... they did all the stenciling on them. Yeah. But you would hang two bags on here, around here, up to here, and to here. And as you ran this, the grain, clean grain, would come out into this bin on the bottom. And this is a bucket elevator that brings the grain up, dumps it out, and uh, you could fill one bag. And when that bag was full, you just slide this over. Then it goes into the other bag, and you tie this bag off and replace it. And, but that's, that's pretty neat. Uh, and also this has, most of them just, you shovel the grain in as needed. Mm -hmm. This one has an adjustable feed on it, mm. so you could fill the bin up and, and just feed as much as you wanted. And this all works. Now this had been converted to an electric motor at some point. Yeah. Uh, which they sat here, but I had a picture of it, and I had gears that pretty much simulated what was there. So a big wooden fan in here that blows air through to blow the chaff out. And then this shakes this, back and forth. Yep. Yeah. Now these came with six, I think five or six different screens, which I have there, different size screening. And it says in the advertisements that a little do grain is down as small as Timothy seed. Wow, <laughs> yeah, that's small. I mean, but even this is like very fine, you know, that, so I can imagine that they just have like a much yeah. finer thr yeah. Yeah, thresher. Now this is everything here hanging up, all the wrenches and all the cultivator pieces are Planet Junior, uh, which I believe they still make. Uh, this is a Planet Junior fertilizer spreader, which is hard to find with because the fertilizer usually rusts them out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, this is the Planet Junior number one. This is a garden seeder and cultivator, and these teeth would inter interchange with any of the cultivators. But you'd put your garden seed in here, and then there's a draw band here that you can adjust up and down, and that adjusts the size of the port that the seed comes out, mm. and it's labeled carrot seed, beet seed, reddish seed for the size of the seed. This is a Planet Junior corn planter. And these are Planet Junior cultivators of various types. And where were they based? Do you know? Is it around here? I'm or? not sure. I actually I don't know if there's an address on this box or not. Uh, I mean, especially if they're still around. I have a box there that Planet Junior parts came in, but yeah. doesn't have an address on it. I'd imagine uh, that their garden tools have evolved, or is it still kind of based on like a... They're, they're still basically just a yeah. hand cultivator. Yeah. I don't know if they still make the, the corn planters and that kind of mm -hmm. thing, but... This is a wheelbarrow seeder. You would set this on the ground like a wheelbarrow, mm -hmm. put your grass seed or clover seed in here, hmm. and as you run this, this jag wheel here moves this shutter back and forth and opens and closes the ports. Hmm. So as in that picture there, you can seed 14 feet, six inches at a pass across the field. Right, Which was yeah. a lot easier than throwing it out by hand. Okay. And then was this made by the same company? Because no. they have the same kind of no, like insignia. No, they're all, every, almost all the companies put the stenciling designs on them. And yeah. It's just, this is a, a bean sorter as well. 
but this one you could have like three people on a side and it's hand crank. Yeah. I, I actually, I, I love the, I mean, the marketing. Oh yeah. Yeah. This is really the greatest grass seeder made today. It's yeah. not a toy, but every, a strong and durable implement specially designed and every, adapted every to Every ad seeders. says that, just like every <laughs> car ad says it's the best car going. You yeah, know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> These two uh, pieces here are uh, Barker Weeder Mulchers. It's the original rototiller, essentially. Hmm. <laughs> And these are potato hillers, which you would use, you could adjust the plow blades so you could open the furrow to plant the mm -hmm. potatoes and, or have them in this position to hill the potatoes out. Mm -hmm. this, uh, this piece here, I got at a yard sale for, I think I gave seven bucks for it. There's a trailer park down near where Donna lives on the main road. And it came from this guy's grandmother's in Dryden. And it's, it's a cultivator, but the neat thing is that these teeth are on a spring. Right. So it's for rocky soil, so if you hit a rock, you didn't break the tines. Huh. And it said, run something here, but I couldn't make it out. Yeah. And I went to a guy that collects wrenches in Newark Valley. He's wrote two books on wrenches. Yeah. You could take all the wrenches that I've got in the blacksmith shop and put them in his basement and you wouldn't know the difference. Yeah. <laughs> but he had just this end without the handle. It's got the original handle on it. Mm -hmm. And, but his was very nicely painted and it says run light. And he said it was patented in a Wego. Really? <laughs> so it's local? Yeah. That's I, crazy. I love to find the local stuff like that. Yeah. You know what that is? That looks like something that you would stick and aerate the soil with somehow. Nope. That's a, a mole killer. A mole oh, killer. that's so... <laughs> jab that in the ground and you pull this up and, and set it and the mole would go through and trip it. You set it over his tunnel and he would have his demise. <laughs> that's far gorier than I imagined. <laughs> again, a lot of these things are not PETA approved. <laughs> <laughs> That's like an aerator of voles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would do it. Now this, uh, this is quite a rare piece here. This is a, called a monta mower. This is the first lawnmower. That's pretty, actually. It looks like just but, like little uh, missing flowers. Missing a couple of teeth on the yeah. ends here, but you would roll this along your lawn and it would cut high grass, low grass. Hmm. No height adjustment to it. But it would, you know, in the city where you got to mow between the sidewalk and your house, yeah. it, it would do the job. <laughs> that was patented in 1924, I believe. And uh, they use it up through the 40s and 50s. This ad is probably from the 30s or 40s. Hmm. Or not that ad, this ad. Mm -hmm. Judging from the, the garb that the lady's wearing. Yeah. Now this one has a wooden handle and I've seen them with a metal handle, with a 3 8 twisted rod handle with no wood. And I think the wooden ones were made during World War II when, right. or, when, when the metal, metal was metal running was scarce. scarce. Yeah. Those are interesting pieces of history that you could triangulate, you know, because I would also imagine that like, oh, maybe wood predated like the metal, but then during times of war, they were using all the metal yeah. for wartime. Now, this is my blacksmith shop. It's a granite curbstone floor, which just feels right to walk on. It's yeah. definitely fireproof. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is about a 1905-1910 Buffalo Forge. And you'll notice the belt that's on the blower. They had replaced that, but it's the same style belt that went on it originally. Where they found that from, somebody must still make it. Hmm. But it was, and that like that, and that blows air up through here to keep your your fire hot. And this is a buffalo forge with a champion blower on it. The blower came from my grandfather's second forge. The first one he had was an oval, thin metal one. And it always amazed me, it had, I think it had a wooden hood on it. 
and the smokestack was wood, four pieces of wood nailed together. Why that never caught fire and burned the place down is beyond yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good but luck. that was my grandfather's anvil, mm -hmm. and I finally found out, well, Bob Johnson found out where that was made and so on. Now, it was actually forged in Cleveland mm -hmm. from 1905 to about 1911, 12, someplace in there. Then they sent the forging of the anvil to Belgium. It was forged in Belgium under their name and then shipped back. Oh, wow. <laughs> the start of like the kind of the global yeah. trade. Yeah. And then that's your gramps? That was my grandfather, yeah. 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 And then that obviously was. not all of these tools were his, but no, he added. No, he sold most of his tools to a guy by the name of Gil Valentine from Spencer uh -huh. um, before my grandfather died. And uh, Gil went to Alaska and was a blacksmith in Alaska. Uh, and then he retired and moved back here for a couple of years and then moved to Arizona where he died a couple of years later and now nobody in the family knows what happened to the tools. Wow. Whether they're still in Alaska in the snowbank or what. Yeah. <laughs> it's too bad you couldn't retrieve them. Yeah. yeah. Was is the corn crib new? No, you Yeah, I just crib. just finished that oh, wow. a month, month and a half ago. Cider house I remember was here. So did you repaint all these? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was some of that water-based paint. I just painted them a year ago last winter, and it's wearing off already. Yeah. <laughs> and they've been undercover. They haven't been out in the weather. Right. For some of them were pretty rusty. I mean, I yeah. wire brushed them and so on. But yeah. This one is actually made. All these are different companies, and there were literally thousands of milk companies dairies. This one's made by the oh, like dairy, dairy product company. Yeah. I have one that was made by the Empire Creamery from Spencer, New York. Uh, cream can this size. Hmm. And that's that's a Cornell one. And I got another Cornell milk can out there. This is the original first edition of the Hordes Dairyman magazine from February 13th, 1903. And this is the first year bound together, so it goes through 1904. Uh, you'll see the ad for the Worcester salt. I have a Worcester salt bag, same thing. And it's made for use for dairy and for curing meats. Hmm. You would add it to butter and whatnot. Wow, this is beautiful. Is this like a churner? That's a churn. Yeah. All these are churns up here to here. These are all churns. Crocs, butter crocs. Mm -hmm. This is a butter color box, which had nice graphics on it. Mm. You would add that. It was a yellow color that you added to the butter, and it made it more saleable. Ah, interesting. When you make your own butter, it's a pale yellow. Yeah. The brighter yellow it was, the more saleable it was. Interesting. <laughs> I love that you have some of these from Syracuse as well. You found. This one we got when I got we got one of our old dogs from an old guy up in Dryden. Actually, I had him for 14 years. And he was supposedly four years old when I got him. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, his father was a golden retriever and his mother was a Welsh corgi. So he was a golden retriever body on Welsh corgi legs. <laughs> but a uh, great dog. But that was his water dish. And the yeah. guy gave it to us. <laughs> oh, what a score. <laughs> But I have the milk uh, 
boxes that sat on the porch that yep. the milkman would deliver her milk to. Yep, I remember those. I just got uh, just got this at Salamanca. These are very rare. Milk testing kit. This is lacking. There's a, a bottle, glass test tube, essentially that sat in there. Mm -hmm. And you wanted to know the butterfat content of each cow, as if you had one that. And nowadays it doesn't matter so much, but if you had a cow that produced a lot of milk, but there wasn't much butter fat in it, that wasn't a good cow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you put the, there's four, four here, so you put milk from four different cattle in there, then you crank this. Oh, so it's like a centrifuge. It's like a centrifuge. Yeah. And the, the Amazing. Cream, the cream separates out, and then you can tell how much butter fat. Is it goes in so fast. It does. Yeah. You don't want to have your face in the way. No, I, I didn't expect them to come out like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there were several companies that made that. Babcock mm -hmm. uh, invented it, but he never patented it. So several companies made it hmm. or something similar to it. Yeah. These are butter workers. You would take your butter out of your churn and put it in here. And of course it had some milk and liquid in it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you would work this back and forth and uh, work the, the water and whey out of it and that would drip out the end. That we got in our antique shop up on Route 20 and it, the lady didn't had no idea what it was. She said they told her it was an apple crusher. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> but Donna and I both knew what it was. Yeah. So got that at a good price. But this one was patented in 1884, but they made it through the 30s because they've got an ad from a 1930s seed catalog with it in. And they had one like this with this type of a roller on it mm -hmm. to roll back and forth. They made hundreds of different kinds of these. But this one, the roller stays stationary and the table moves. Hmm. As it moves, it squashes the liquid out and it goes out that hole into this little eaves trough. And of course, the eaves trough expands and contracts by hand because when you're actually using it, when the table's out here, you still got to catch the liquid. So, did these, are these like the butter insignia? But, like butter, you, butter, butter molds. Make, yeah, butter yeah, mold yeah. makers. Yeah, they're expensive. Yeah. I've been fortunate to find those for good prices, but yeah. they usually want 50, 60, 80, 100 dollars for them. Wow. These are ice cream makers. This one has the original store tag on it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Amazing. You could read that or not. But uh, Dasher Churns, they've got a wooden one and a, and a ceramic one all kinds of milk cans. This is a dilution cream separator, which I had never heard of before. I got that up to Farmington Mall for a really cheap price because it had this sticker on it, mm -hmm. but they had a tag on it that said planter. Really? <laughs> and a lot of, and a lot of people dairy use supplies them for right that. there? Yeah, okay. a lot of people use them for a planter. I see, okay. But this, I think, is brand new because there's no rust or anything inside yeah. it. But you would unscrew this screen and take this and put it on this end, and put the screen back in, and you could set this on the top ah. and use it as a funnel to pour your, your, you fill that half with milk, and then you add water. And with the tube on, the, on this end, your water would, there's two tubes there, the water would go to the bottom. Mm -hmm. And then that will, usually it takes 12 hours for the cream to rise, just gravity. Mm -hmm. But this one was mixed with the water, it says it will rise in, I think it's a 45 minutes to and a half an the, hour. And then it releases the rest of the liquid off down there? Yep, and yeah. you draw the, draw the milk and the water off down there, and mm -hmm. the cream would stay in there, and get a gauge there, it tells you how much you had as far as cream content. These are cream sep or milk separators, cream separators. I cranked this one as a kid from my grandfather. This one came from my oldest cousin who was 92 or 94 now. Mm. Her 
husband's family. And uh, I even got the instruction and repair book oh, for that. Wow. <laughs> Look at that. And they have the original wrenches with them. Mm. But the cream would come out the, the top. It's, it's like a centrifuge, too. There's a bunch of little cones in there that mm -hmm. spin very fast and uh, spins the butter particles are heavier or lighter. So the milk comes out first and the butter later. Look at the cowbells, too. The other way around. Yeah, all kinds of cowbells. Some of the small ones were turkey bells and goat bells. They actually put bells on their turkeys. Turkeys? To, oh my to goodness. Keep track of them. But I love you can tell the difference in the tone of the different ones. Yeah. Does that. And oh, yeah. You could probably, you know, tell where one specific cow was by right. the tone. Right. <laughs> right. The two barrels in the back. The chair there are cottage cheese making barrels. You would fill those with. Uh, These ones right here? Yep. Yeah. Just fill those with raw milk and add rennet to it, and that made it uh, into cottage cheese very quickly. This is a cheese press, probably from about 1875. Everything on this is wood, the wood pulleys, the wood dowels but you would put your cheese in a cheesecloth in a box here, and there really should be two of these handles, but then you'd simply crank that up, and it would squash the cheese into the box, mm. and, and the liquid would come out. And we have bull leads there. These are anti-kick chains. If you had a cow that was kick when you milked it, mm. you put that over the back hocks, and that would prevent it from kicking. And they had these with a ring in the middle that you could slide the tail through, because if you ever milked a cow with a crappy tail and it swats you in the face with the tail, yeah. it's not comfortable. <laughs> uh, these are calf wieners. Some of these are very archaic. They look <laughs> Again, very pita nut. Sado. <laughs> yeah. uh, this one we thought was homemade, but I actually found it in the 1897 Sears and Roebuck catalog. It's simply spikes and leather. Huh. <laughs> but you didn't get near mama with that. <laughs> no, absolutely not. So the mom would probably like kick it, kick yeah. at the yeah. yeah. I'm very tempted to. Is this chair oh, yeah. stable? It's, yeah. Looks very yeah. comfortable. It is. It's that's nice. <laughs> that was given to me by a neighbor. It was kind of rickety, but I put some screws in the right places and tightened it up. Yeah, that's a nice chair. I love the shape of it, too. The lanterns both work. We come down here and eat supper some down here some nights and have a pizza down here. Yeah, it's so special. Bring some hamburgers down or whatever. Yeah. These are cow pokes up here. And People think a cowpoke is a cowboy. <laughs> well, it's not. Uh, these are cowpokes, and they're called cowpokes because this went around the neck of the cow, and some cows tend to push through the fence. This would prevent them from doing that because these spikes would push into them. That was before, like, the electric fence, yeah. essentially. <laughs> before electric, period. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, these are cattle dehorners to cut the horns off the cattle. Nowadays they burn them out when they're small. Hmm. Uh, this Donna calls a husband beater, I call it a wife beater. <laughs> you, can, you can lift that. <laughs> wow. But that's an ice breaker to break ice in yeah. the water trough or yeah. pond. Or animals could get water in the winter. I recall getting my milk this way, and like the, you know, well, we used the, to have a, a milkman that delivered. The red bottles, the three on the bottom on the left. Yeah. Uh, Donna lives on the old red sicker farm, the tenant house, huh. They're all next to where it was. Uh, this is a pretty neat piece. We found this up po Hulbert Hollow after a flood. Surrounded in rocks, nothing but rocks around it. Not a chip out of it. Frigidaire it's, milk bottle cover. It's a milk bottle wow. cover made by Frigidaire. Yeah. And when you open the can of bottle of milk and set that on it, yeah. 
keep it keep it fresh in the fresh refrigerator. And cool. But there's not a chip on that, and it it was in rocks that were bigger in this cabinet. You know yeah. why it didn't break? I have no idea. Well, it looks like a pretty thick piece of glass yeah, too. But still, there's not even a chip out of it. Yeah. Oh, these are various kinds of milk stools. They had a milk stool that they made like this with just one wooden leg in the middle and mm -hmm. it would strap to your box so you didn't have to carry the milk stool around with them. <laughs> Found this down to Bostwick. That's amazing. And this was actually made in Iceland. Stamped on it. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah, but I'd never seen one with a spring on it. No. And then we were down to the Group 34 lawn sales and we stopped at Bostwick's again and they had their uh, yard sale going out front there, and they had another one just like this, but that one was made in Holland, <laughs> and not nearly as good condition. These are barrel churns, and they made different sizes of these. I've got three different sizes. They made, I think, seven different sizes. Now, what do they do in these bowls? Those they, were butter bowls. Butter bowls, and they yep, just like... Yeah, for small amounts of butter. Okay. They work just like this only mm -hmm. for small amounts. Now this, uh, this is just like the barrel churns. This was invented by L.A. Uh, Spinwall, and he made only beekeeping equipment, with the exception of this, and I think this was a takeoff from his honeycomb spinner. Hmm. But it's it's pretty neat. It's just like the barrel churns, only it runs by the slubber here, and it turns just oh, as easily right as can be. Yeah. <laughs> but it's got the information on there, and they made different sizes of this, and you had a different size weight to perfectly balance each mm -hmm. one. That's, I had never seen one of those. I got that over to Corning. Most of the antique stores, the local stores, knows, know what I have here, and they give me good deals on stuff. So. Yeah. <laughs> Just because they know where it's going. <laughs> well, it's good after you've built so many relationships with folks and know that, that you're creating something yep. so beautiful. And a lot of the antique stores, when I walk in, they'll say, oh, Come over here, I got something here. I don't know what it is, see if you know. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Uh, this is a butler's cart. I thought it was, the name came from the butler that brings your food and so on, but it was actually made by the butler manufacturing company. Ah, uh, I see, so yeah. And it was used to carry name. barrels and milk cans and so on. Yeah. This oh. is a collection of barbed wire. Oh, that's cool to that see it displayed that way. Uh, and I bought it just like that at a very good price. Oh, you did? Down okay. To, uh, uh, the Emporium in Uigo. There's uh, people down there that I'm good friends with, and they gave me a really good price on it. But I had never seen fence like that no. or that. Yeah, that's a funny Greg snake. And this is <laughs> this is actually the fence for that one. Wow. But they had them all labeled. The that's cool. Well, whoever did that, that's pretty neat. There's, uh, yeah, and they're usually pretty expensive. But this is a Townsend wire stretcher. And these three are all exactly the same. But this was made in uh, painted post, and patented in painted post. And when that guy died, they apparently sold the patent to somebody in Michigan. These were made in Michigan, but it's the exact same thing. So that would take the, it would just make, it's put clamp, tension. Clamps on the wire and yeah. you put it on your post and stretch the post yeah. and, and stretch the wire. And, and various kinds of uh, cattle uh, stanchions. So you got one down to uh, the Wego Antiques. There that's really old I'd like to have, but they went way out of line for the price. <laughs> way out of line. <laughs> so this is the newest building. This is our, my uh, corn corn crib, which would have been used to store corn in to dry their corn. Right. These are all corn shellers to yeah. take the And you got quite a here. lot from the local area, actually. Yep. 
These are all local on this side. Seneca this one, Falls, Ithaca. This one I just got down to uh, Tioga Downs, the antique store is down mm -hmm. there. But this is really old because all the other ones have a cast iron uh, port where the ear goes in. Mm -hmm. This is wood. But uh, this one's made in Owego. There used to be a hardware store in Ithaca by the, the Treeman Hardware Store. Later became Treeman and King, but they ran from like 1830s to 1930s. And uh, they had a foundry as well. And in 18, I'm not sure when the foundry started for, for sure, but in 1872, uh, which I can make out the patent number on this, but I can't make out the writing on it, but I know it's a made in Ithaca by the Treeman Valentine and Green operated the foundry. And from actually before 1873 to 1876. And then by 1876, Valentine left the firm and it was just Treeman and Green. This one is plainly marked Treeman and Green. And then in 1880, Waterman joined the firm and Green left. Waterman was one of the Treeman brothers' son-in-laws and that one's Mark Treeman and Waterman. <laughs> so I've got all three eras. These are feed cutters uh, for corn stalks and hay. In the 1890s, they discovered that if you chopped the hay and corn up, it was more palatable to the cows and <laughs> easier to handle. Mm -hmm. And so these, this type is strictly a, a knife type. You slid it through and chopped it up. This is a self-feed one. It says a knobby roller inside here. And you lay a bundle of corn stalks in there and that draws it through. And this blade cuts it up into shorter pieces. And these are all the different types of corn huskers. Corn look husking at, pegs, yep. Oh my God, look at hand. that. Some yeah. of them are homemade by wood. Some yeah. of them are made of bone. A lot of them are manufactured. I've got several there that are duplicates. But. And so the, it would fit through here or? Your, your fingers would slip through there. Ah, oh, I see. And that would protect your hands when you're husking the corn. Okay. Because the corn husks are sharp. When right. When you're doing a bunch of them, yeah. your hands get wore out. <laughs> uh, these are corn drying racks. These are manufactured ones, all the same. You could hook these together. Mm -hmm. And you would save out your best ears of corn that you wanted to save for seed and stick them on there to dry them and hang them up in your woodshed or wherever, yeah. and that would keep the mice from getting them. This one is, is blacksmith made, and you can see how intricate they yeah, did that, that just mm -hmm. for some mundane reason. This one on this end is, just demonstrates their ability to use whatever is at hand. This was made from a piece of American wire fence. Yeah. <laughs> but the ingenuity that they used is amazing to me. Absolutely. Now this corn shower here is a very rare one. I paid some good money for that, but I got a good deal on it actually for what it valued at, but uh, this was made by Philo and Ferrier and Son, or Philo, Ferrier and Son. But this, the main thing on this that's different is this gear here that runs against these gears that peel the, the corn off the cob is on a pivot, so it automatically adjusts for mm -hmm. the size of the ear. And most of these, the corn actually just falls out at the bottom and the ears are kicked out the end, hmm. the cobs. This one, the cobs go into this box here and the corn falls down into the box underneath. Yeah. Well, this one's either hand crank or belt driven. There's a pulley on the other side. You could use a belt on it, but it has a very unique chain that takes the corn cobs out but I don't know 
who made that. I can't find it in any of my books. And yeah. Without a name, you can't find it on the internet. Right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> this is a corn husker made by C.N. Lewis in Seneca Falls, in 18, patented in 1857. Uh, you take a piece of field corn, which is dried and hard in the husk, just as it came off the stalk, put the cob in here, and the ear in there, and the stem sticks out here, and you could adjust this for the size of the ear, and you jab that down through it, and it cuts us, goes through the husk, cuts the stem off the cob, and this kicker comes in, and actually pushes the cob out of the end of the husk. Wow. The husk and the stem stay here, I can shoot a piece of field corn out 10 or 12 feet. <laughs> when I first discovered what it did, uh, field corn wasn't ripe yet, but sweet corn was around, so mm -hmm. I figured well, I'll try a piece of sweet corn, which doesn't husk near as easily. And, it's, and so I'm standing on the other side of it, and jab this down through the stem, and it gets stuck halfway through the mushy stem, and I yeah. weasel it up off and jab it again, pretty near shot myself. <laughs> I can shoot a piece of sweet corn out about six or eight feet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not as cleanly as... Uh, field corn, yeah. but I soon learned you should probably stand on this side of it while operating. <laughs> <laughs> you learned the hard way. These are uh, our corn huskers, or corn shellers as well, but these are barrel mount, or box mount, or table mount, whatever you want to call them. So you do a small amount of time, whatever you needed to make your cornmeal mush or whatever. These are corn knives cut to corn stalks. And I mentioned the corn cedars mm -hmm. and planters. I mean, uh, I, I love this too. Like, look at, the, look at this. Uh... Yeah, that's a pumice fork. It's actually got the, the labels on it yet. Yeah. It's used to shovel corn cobs. Mm -hmm. It's used, I've got another one in the cider shed that's used to, uh, same thing, that was called a pumice fork in that case. Uh, pum being the French word for apple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You shoveled apples in a cider mill and didn't yeah. stab the apples. Yeah. Or you could use it to sift potatoes out of the soil after you ran through with a potato digger. Amazing. But these are all different styles of, of corn planters. These three here are all wood. They're very early. I've got two empty slots on the end for a Buckeye corn planter, which were made in Spencer. Hmm. Uh, one with a pumpkin seed attachment and one without. And they're down to the Spencer Museum right now. steps on a corn crib because you wanted to keep the rodents out and normally on top of the post to set on that's why mm -hmm. it's set up in the air they mm -hmm. would have like a tin pie plate nailed to the top so they couldn't get up around it and normally the wire would be on the inside so it would be pushing against the studs but I gain in four inches by putting it on the outside right. corn planter. Right, just so. to have a little bit more space. <laughs> Adapt a little. <laughs> this is one of the uh, jacks, wagon jacks, that was made in Ithaca by E.S. Husson. Uh, in 1862, he was a blacksmith shop on Geneva Street, and he made these jacks, a wagon jack, and every one of these these were probably cast in the Treeman and King Foundry or in the Williams Foundry in mm. Ithaca, but it says patent February 
1862 wow. by E. Husson, Ithaca, New York. Wow. Uh, it's probably the largest collection of Husson's acts around that I know of. <laughs> wow. This is a 19, about a 1915 Moline Wagon Company wagon. They uh, made wagons, but they didn't sell them themselves. They, they farmed out the selling of them to various other places. John Deere sold them. John Deere eventually bought them in 1850, 1815, but it kept the same name. Now, originally, when I got this, it had wooden spoked rims with a metal tire rim on and, mm -hmm. and rubber tires on it. But rubber tires were just coming into being, and these tires are all flat, and they're an odd size. I never found any like them. And uh, so I had that set of wagon wheels there that fit on it, so they made them with wooden wheels or rubber wheels at that time as an option. And I made the hay rigging for it, carry loose hay. But you've got, you can take that block and tackle and put a couple ropes under this and the box just sits on the frame. You can lift it up and pull the chassis out and put a different style box on mm -hmm. it if you want. <laughs> and there's several different kinds of wagon jacks there. The first three are uh, Paragon wagon jacks. This one's a Miller. Uh, this one is called a main carriage jack. They started making these in 1830. That one, I didn't believe, came from 1830, but they made them for a lot of years. Yeah. Uh, this one's homemade. That one I haven't found any place yet. But this one I just got last year, and this is pretty neat. It's all wood, but it runs on a wooden cam. Oh, look at that. That's pretty ingenious. Yeah. Wow. But I haven't ever seen a picture of that one yet. And these are Samson grinders. And you can tell those typically because they have the round support in them. Mm -hmm. This is a non pareil fertilizer and lime spreader, horse drawn. Uh, this is a spike tooth cultivator that's very early and I don't know who made it. There are no bolts or anything that hold that together. It's held together by these little cast iron brackets. You lay the bars out, drive the spike in, and that's what holds it together. Yeah. But this is very old because these are hand forged, these hooks. Now you couldn't take that from one field to another without ripping up the road because the teeth don't retract. Right. So you had to take it apart and put it on a stone boat and you know, another wagon and haul it away. These are grocery bobs. You would build your own box for these and take it to town for to get your groceries or small amounts of stuff. Uh, this sleigh here, the same woman that gave me the ice plow gave me that. Amazing. She gave me easily $1,000 worth of stuff. Wow. <laughs> the runners were rusted on, or rotted on the bottom of the wood where it had sat in their, in their basement and gotten water on it. Yeah, and, and this is more a couple of them. based in the Adirondacks you mentioned yeah. that she's from? Yeah. I thought I had like five different uh, tongues that I thought would fit on this but they're all 36 inch mm -hmm. and this is a 30 inch and I'm told the 30 inch are very hard to find mm -hmm. and this this would actually probably take a 30 inch but this is a 36 inch one here so it's a little farm sled that my cousin actually gave me with the tongue this is a bob sled that they would use to haul logs and firewood out of the woods this is the tongue which goes on there, on that bar. And you could adjust this by moving this nut and bolt to the various uh, holes and make it longer or shorter depending on the size of the log you were hauling. I've got some Vern Morton pictures up there with the bobsleds on them. Now this is called a half bob. That's essentially the front bob of a bobsled and they would use that to uh, gather maple syrup in the winter or whatever. 
This is a spring tooth cultivator. That's one of the first ones made. That was made in the 1880s by the Farmer's Friend Manufacturing Company. And that has a wooden frame and now that's the original wood on it. <laughs> and that's also pulled by like a... Pulled by horses. horses everything, yeah. everything was... Well, some things later on were converted to tractor them, but mm -hmm. they are built to be drawn by horses originally. This is a 1905 E.M. Osborne uh, spike tooth cultivator, and on this one you could raise the teeth up in the position that they're now in. And when you did that, these little shoes on the corner came down, so you could drag that from field to field without ripping the road up.
us know what you thought of the tour with Wayne in the comments below. And if you love the stories that we produce, then please consider liking, subscribing, hitting the notifications button, and even donating. Your viewership makes a difference, as 10% of our Google AdSense proceeds are being reinvested back into the community, which is matched by our partners over at Espoma Organic. In the meantime, have a lovely day, and we'll see you in the next video.